Psalm 22, verses 1 through 2, and verse 11. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Have you ever felt like this psalmist? Have you ever felt forsaken by God or abandoned by God? Like you're crying out to him, but no one is answering, no one is hearing your prayer? Have you felt like God has ignored you? or removed the warmth of his presence and now you're left alone in the cold, dark night? Have you ever gone from a mountaintop experience of God's goodness where you really just felt so loved by God to perhaps the very next day feeling alone and abandoned in the deepest, darkest valley? I know I have. Today we're continuing in our sermon series, but I thought the messy meeting of faith and life. And we have been exploring those times in our lives where our theology or our thoughts about God, our beliefs about God, the things that we read in the Bible maybe and understand to be true, seem to be in conflict with the messy parts of our lives. But I thought God would always be with me. But I thought you promised to never leave me or forsake me. But I thought you would stay near, especially when things get tough. Where are you, God? There are a lot of reasons why we might find ourselves asking these questions or saying these kinds of things to God. And if we're honest, sometimes those reasons have to do with things that are mostly in our control. I say mostly, and I'm going to give a little caveat because I know that there are forces that act on our own free will, right? There are things that sometimes prevent us from just choosing the right way, whether it's subconscious patterns or behaviors, things that maybe happened in our childhood that were beyond our control, whether it's societal or cultural injustices that are kind of set up against us that don't really allow us to make totally free decisions. But with that caveat, I think these are still things that are mostly within our control. So reasons we might experience God as absent. Could you put the slide up? Okay, number one, sin and guilt. This is unrepentant sin or guilt about that sin. Things that keep us separate from God. And I'm not saying that, you know, when we sin, God decides to punish us by turning his back on us and walking away from us because he's done with us. No, I mean, when we choose to sin, when we knowingly choose away from God, the consequence is that we've chosen away from God, right? And so we might experience God as absent. Number two, shame. Shame is a little different than guilt, right? Where guilt can actually be productive and lead us to repentance and confession. Guilt says, I did something bad. Shame is more like, I am bad. Shame is what caused Adam and Eve to hide in the Garden of Eden after they sinned, right? It says that because of their shame, they hid from God. They experienced separation from God. Number three, disengaging. Disengaging. So maybe that's giving up the the practices, the habits that help us to connect to God and to the family of God. Perhaps that's going to church or going to a small group or reading our Bible, having some kind of personal, spiritual, devotional practice. Maybe it's for you listening to worship music, whatever it is that makes you feel that connection to your faith. Maybe we've disengaged. Maybe that's the reason we're experiencing God as absent. And number four, distraction. Perhaps we're just too busy. We're hurtling through life. We're just trying to be productive and make money and get things done and get, you know, check the next thing off our to-do list. And we're too distracted to notice the presence of God with us 
at every moment. We talked about that a lot on our women's retreat last year. Distraction. I'm sure there are other reasons, mostly within our control, that we might experience God as absent. But I don't want to spend a ton of time here because there are some pretty quick, easy remedies for these things, right? So sin, if you have unrepentant sin or if you're feeling guilty, a pretty quick, easy remedy that the Bible offers to us is confession and repentance. We do this every week in worship. We come together and we confess the ways that we have turned our back on God and on one another and even on ourselves. Repentance means turning your life around. So maybe you've been choosing to go away from God. You're going to choose to turn around and go towards God again. Shame. The remedy for shame that tells us that we need to hide in the darkness because we are bad is coming out into the light, coming out into community, speaking with a a trusted friend, reading and holding on to the truth that you are beloved that is told to us in scripture, being reminded of your identity. And yes, sometimes there are a deeper deeper works that need to be done with shame. Maybe it's going to a therapist and really working through some of those things. That one might not be as easy of a fix as (laughs) guilt or sin. Disengaging, a remedy, engage. Choose some practice that is going to reconnect you, right? Come back to church, join a small group, start listening to worship music in your car if that's your thing. And distraction. The remedy is to make some space. Slow down and pay attention. Pay attention. All right. That's the easy stuff. (laughs) That's the easy stuff this morning. If any of this resonated with you, though, hold on to it. Think about it. What, What is something in your life, maybe a practice or something that you have chosen that is pulling you away from God? And how might God be calling you to make some different decisions, to come back into the light of his presence? The harder part, the challenge really, I think, to our faith, which is mostly out of our control, is when life circumstances come up, unexpected life circumstances that we would not choose, and when those things plunge us into what's called a dark night of the soul. Here, what's the remedy? There is no simple one-step remedy We need to find a faith that works, even in the darkest night, not only when all is well and good and brightly lit in our lives, what Barbara Brown Taylor refers to as a solar faith. We need to find a faith that also works in the darkness, a lunar faith. Have you heard this phrase, the dark night of the soul? Is that familiar to anyone? A few people. It means different things to different people. Some use this phrase to describe a time following a loss, an experience of of great suffering in their lives, or even a time leading up to a difficult and pivotal decision where you are just anguishing over what's the right thing to do. But the dark night of the soul is, without a doubt, a place of spiritual desolation. It's a time often where God is experienced as distant or absent, where we feel alone in our suffering, in our anguish. During the dark night of the soul, our belief systems are shaken up and maybe even deconstructed a little bit, where we question the things that we have always held on to be true. We ask those questions that we've been asking throughout this sermon series, right? I thought, God would protect me. I thought God would reward me. I thought Christians were supposed to be different. I thought. The dark night is a really uncomfortable place to be. Most of us avoid it at all costs. In fact, I think in in our culture and even in our Christian kind of heritage, we are taught to avoid the darkness, to fear it, and even to disdain it. I think even as adults, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, many of us are still kind of afraid of the dark. Some of us might even sleep with a nightlight. Again, I'm not asking you to confess. 
When asked why uh, my dad won't eat mushrooms, his response is always, I don't eat things that grow in the dark, mm. right? There's this just kind of, I don't know, uncomfortable feeling about the darkness. It's something to be avoided. Never mind that he has a complete double standard when it comes to the mashed potatoes and the roasted carrots, but the darkness is something to be avoided. No one chooses the dark night of the soul. The dark night simply descends. No one seeks out an experience of God's absence and the accompanying disorientation that comes with that. The dark night just descends. Perhaps it comes when an accident steals the lives of innocent people. Perhaps it comes with the cancer diagnosis. Perhaps it comes with the discovery of a spouse's infidelity or the betrayal of a trusted friend. Perhaps it comes even with an overseas experience where you are confronted with the extreme depravity and brokenness of the world in a way that you had never been before. For myself, one of my dark nights of the soul happened during a several year period of stress and sickness in my early 20s. It went on for a long time, and this struggle with my health led me to feeling totally alone. I felt left behind by my peers, by my friends who couldn't understand what it was that I was going through. I felt shrugged off by a multitude of doctors. Eventually, I felt forsaken by God. This darkness felt so heavy and oppressive that I, I literally could not find my way through it and back out into the light of God's presence and blessing, the place where I had been before. But I thought, God, you promised to always stay by my side. The 16th century monk St. John of the Cross experienced his own dark night of the soul when he was imprisoned in a dark cell for 11 months for his theological convictions. And during this time, he wrestled mightily with God and with his own theology, his own beliefs about God and what God was doing. And yet the subsequent work, his writings upon this, are not contrary to what you might think doomy and gloomy. In fact, they're full of hope. St. John reflects that the dark night, this time of, of helplessness and weariness and defeat and abandonment and emptiness, can actually be God's greatest gift to his people. He writes that the dark night can be a gift to us because it serves to liberate us, to free us, from a childish or immature faith. And this happens in part because we are freed from our reliance upon our feelings. St. John wrote this. God is purging the soul, annihilating it, emptying it, or consuming in it, even as a fire consumes the moldiness and the rust of metal. All the affections and imperfect habits which it has contracted its whole life. Or in our language, God uses the refining fire of the dark night to free us from the lesser things that we put our faith and our trust in. Things that are not God. Things that we re rely on that pull us away from total reliance upon God. The dark night gives us an opportunity to self-examine to look at what it is that we truly believe about God and to question whether those things are where our trust should be, to find out whether our trust is truly in God or if it's actually in ourselves or maybe more specifically for our context this morning, if it's actually in our feelings toward God. God puts our lights out to keep us safe. St. John says, because we are never more in danger of stumbling than when we think we know where we are going. Whew. When we can no longer see the path we are on, only then can we truly and fully learn 
to rely on God. Wow. Now, if this loss of control sounds profound, but also profoundly scary, don't worry, I am right there with you. It is terrifying and disorienting, and again, not something that any of us really wants to choose. And the psalmist is there with us too, remember? I read these words right at the start. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. I think sometimes in the Christian church, we hear words like this and we, we think them a sign of, of unbelief or of a weak faith, that some, somehow it's bad to feel like this or to say things like this or to pray prayers like this. You know, as I see these words, as I hear them, as I speak them out, I think these honest prayers of lament are some of the deepest, truest expressions of faith that we can pray. The psalmist here has absolutely no pretense, right? He is laid bare before God. He's inviting God into the depths of his despair, calling upon God to show up, to be true to God's promise, to never leave him or forsake him. Instead of just avoiding the dark night or like pretending it's not happening or even allowing his soul to harden into a kind of apathy, the psalmist is entering into it fully. He's crying out from the depths of the dark night, inviting God to show up. Sounds familiar to me. I thought, God, you promised to always be there, to always be here. But I thought you promised to never leave me or forsake me. But I thought you would stay near, especially when things get tough. The psalmist invites us to be totally candid with God about our feelings, about our experience. But here's the thing. The psalmist doesn't stop there, right? The psalmist doesn't get stuck in his feelings. Lament psalms don't stop at feelings. They invariably move from the raw, honest expression of grief and suffering and feeling abandoned or experiencing God's absence and into an affirmation of the trust of the character of God. So Psalm 22 goes on to talk about God's deliverance. The Psalm starts out with this cry of, of deep anguish, this honest expression of feeling forsaken by God. And then within just a few verses, it moves toward affirming the truth that God has kept them safe their whole lives, that God has been with them, has held them since birth. Somehow the psalmist is able to receive the gift of the dark night of the soul that St. John of the Cross talked about. That sense of freedom from needing to feel God's presence in the ways that they have been used to. They now have this ability to claim the truth and to trust God even in the darkness, they have found a faith that works in the dark. Here's the truth. God promises to be with us. And God's promise to be with us, to be present with us, is one of the sure promises of God that we can hold on to even when we're not feeling it. This is a promise of God that we can stake our lives on. Why? Because Jesus, it's the right answer. It's always the right answer. Because Jesus, Jesus came to show us that God would literally move heaven and earth in order to be near to us, in order to walk alongside of us in order to experience everything that we experience, in order that we might know that he loves us. Because Jesus walked alongside of the, the sinner and the outcast and consistently drew near to the people who were suffering the most. 
suffering, the dark night of the soul was not something that ever repelled Jesus. In fact, quite the contrary, it was always something that seemed to draw him to the sufferer. Jesus went to that place. We know that we can trust that God is present because Jesus died and rose again in order that we might be united with God forever. In this life and in eternity. And because Jesus' last words that he said to his followers were literally, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I am with you always to the end of the age. And if you're saying, well, yeah, Jesus is not here anymore, Lindsay. He's not walking around with us anymore. Well, he left us the Holy Spirit. He left us the Holy Spirit so that we would know that Jesus is closer than our breath at all times. Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and night wrap itself around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. Night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Even, and perhaps especially in the dark night of the soul, in the times where we feel like God has abandoned us, where we feel the most alone, where we feel the most anguish in our souls, we can trust that God is right there with us. But darkness is not dark to him, and there's no place we can flee from his presence. Now, like I said, there's no easy one-step remedy for the dark night of the soul. Sorry. And I don't have some formula for how to quickly feel better. Sometimes the dark night persists for months, sometimes even years. But this is the way that our Christian brothers and sisters have persevered in the faith through their own dark nights of the soul for thousands of years. This is the way that Jesus himself did Jesus persisted and persevered in his faith when he cried out to God in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he asked his friends to stay near and pray with him, and when he called out words of truth, words of scripture from the cross. Lament, trust, and lean on others. Cry out in brutal honesty before God like the psalmist. Call God to action. Lay yourself bare before God. Tell him what you're feeling. Lament. And then trust. Hold on to the truth that you read in Scripture, that there is nowhere that you can flee from God's presence, that God will neither leave you nor forsake you, that God has left with you the Holy Spirit who is closer than your breath. And when you can't find the strength to trust, when you can't find the strength even to cry out, lean on the faith of others. Lean into your community. Lean into the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us when we don't have words to pray. Lament, trust, lean on others. So my friends, have you ever felt forsaken by God? abandoned, like God is ignoring your cries, like God has removed the warmth and light of his presence and left you alone in the cold, dark night. There is hope for you. That in your dark night, your faith is being forged and refined by that fire into something that is more solid and more true. A faith that works in the darkness of the night as well as the daylight. A faith that trusts beyond sight that we are not alone, that we are not abandoned, not even for a second. Because God is with us always to the very end of the age. 